I don't know why, but this topic just excites me today. It excites me all the time. I don't know whether it's going to excite you, <laughs> but I pulled out some old teaching and uh, it's more relevant today than it was when the Lord gave it to me. So let's just open in prayer and we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the sunshine today and we thank you for new growth and the promise of spring and summer and harvest planting. Um, it's, it's just so easy to see your hand with the farmers on the land and seed being spread. And Lord, this is the hour that you have your church in. It's always been to go and to evangelize and disciple. But Lord, sometimes we can't get out of our own way and we don't know why we're stuck. So today I pray that you would open our eyes and our spirits to see what it is you need us to see in our lives as individuals, but also corporately, Lord. What is it that's been holding the church back? Why is the church largely powerless and apathetic? And Lord, I ask you to stir our spirits and show us the places where we need to repent so that we can be found good stewards and we can put a smile on our dad's face. So we give you this time. And we ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to take control of all the conversation. Pray that it would be pleasing to you and it would accomplish what you have intended it to. We give you this time in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So the last time we talked about the spirit of fear, otherwise known as an unholy fear, fears of the flesh, or the fear of man, and it's basically a sinful fear. We will dive in right now to, discuss, to discussing the fear of the Lord. If you have your handouts, the very first thing we're going to do as we do every session is we need to define what the fear of the Lord means. Before we can understand it or talk about it intelligently, we need to know that we're all on the same page and we are defining the same term. And I want you to know that it's important that the, to understand there's a fear of God that is not the fear of the Lord. It's not a holy fear. And we find this in Matthew 25 when Jesus is talking about the parable of the talents. And in verse 25, when the owner comes home and checks in with his servants, we hear the wicked servant who's making excuses for his laziness. And he said, I was afraid, so I went and hid your talent in the ground. That's an unhealthy fear of God. And that was based on his fear of punishment or failure. He didn't try because he wanted to protect it so he could say, I didn't lose your money. That's a different kind of fear. It's still a fear of the Lord, but it's not the healthy one. And that's not the type of fear that God's looking for. It's not what we're talking about today. It's not a punitive view of God or a fear of punishment or retribution by an angry God. To fear the Lord means that we have a deep respect, awe, and a submission to God. In its simplest form, that's the definition. To have a deep respect, awe, and submission to God. It's an awareness of his power, his holiness, and his commands. And to fear the Lord means that we are going to honor him and obey him with our entire being. That's what it means to walk in the fear of the Lord. God doesn't want us to be terrified of him, but he does demand that we approach him with respect, reverence, awe, and thankfulness. Fear of the Lord is a fear that says to him, I recognize your power and authority over every part of creation, including me and everything that pertains to my life. This fear is developed through an intimate understanding and familiarity with God and his word. The Bible's clear that the fear of God is a beneficial thing. It's a good thing. It's a fear that's born out of respect for your maker. And fear of the Lord brings fullness of life, blessing and reward and protection to people who know how to walk in it. But first, we probably need to ask the question, why would God even want us to be afraid of him? You know, the Bible repeatedly speaks about the benefits of fearing the Lord. 
And if you've ever thought about this, especially if you're a parent or even as a, when you were growing up as a child, if you think about your own home, the relationship we hold with our heavenly father is intended to be reflected in our human families as well. And just like any parent, God wants his children, the people he created, to respect him, to obey him, and to be grateful to him. Most of us learned our family's rules and codes of conduct from being corrected as children. And sometimes when we as children failed to heed the rules of our parents, despite numerous warnings, then the level and the intensity of the correction tended to increase. Don't touch that, Nancy. Nancy, step away from that. Nancy, don't touch that. But Nancy wanted to keep touching it. So the more I persisted, the level of correction, discipline, the intensity of the warning would increase. And sometimes the parent's discipline needs to become more severe or intense, depending on how rebellious or unheeding the child is to the parent's direction. It works much the same way with God and the household of faith. When we spend time with him, we learn to understand why he put his commands in place. They're for our protection and they're our good. And when our spiritual understanding grows, our love and respect for God grows also. And as we mature in our spiritual understanding, we finally learn what John 4, 7 to 18 really means. These get quoted a lot, but it's only people who walk in the fear of the Lord that really grasp the depth of these verses when it says there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves torment but he who fears has not been made perfect in love and then romans 8 15 says we didn't receive a spirit of bondage to fear but we received the spirit of adoption and we cry out abba father as we grow in our love for God, we begin to understand that he is not a cruel taskmaster who just wants to torment us, but he's a loving father who has standards and rules of conduct for his household. He expects obedience from the kids that live in his house. So what does the fear of the Lord look like? Here, are, let's see, how many have I got? Four examples of fear of the Lord in the Bible. We don't have to look far. Some of these we've talked about before. In Genesis 22, <clears throat> excuse me, we see Abraham's greatest test when God asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac in obedience to the Lord. And Abraham did what he was asked. But in verse 12, we see God's response to, Isaac, to Abraham. And he said, do not lay a hand on the lad or do anything to him. For I know now that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Part of the way God knows if we fear him is if we're willing to surrender everything to him, everything that matters to us and everything that we hold most dear. In Exodus 18, we read the account of Moses talking with his father-in-law Jethro and Moses was struggling. He was getting burned out and overwhelmed because he didn't know how to delegate. And Jethro came up and said, listen, Moses, you need to go out and select from all the people, some able men, men that fear God, men of truth, men who hate covetousness, and then put those men over the people of Israel to be ruler of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Notice that the first requirement for a position of leadership over God's people was that they walk in the fear of the Lord. Jeremiah 26 tells us that King Hezekiah of Judah feared God and sought the favor of the Lord. He wanted God's blessings. He wanted to please the Lord. And in Malachi 3, we see God's mercy and protection that's going to be extended toward his faithful remnant in the great and terrible day of the Lord. And in verses 16 to 18, it says, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard them. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. 
On the day when I will act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. This chapter in Malachi talks about the great and terrible day of the Lord that's going to come upon the earth. And he said, those that fear the Lord are going to be protected and spared. That would be a great incentive, I think, to figure out what fear of the Lord is and start moving in that direction, if we're not already. So do you think you're a person who walks daily in the fear of the Lord? How would you know? I found a quick little assessment that I'll ask you with these five points. And this came from a blog that I found by Dr. Stuart Padigo, who is a pastor of Joy Community Church. Never heard of him before, but I appreciated what he had to say on the subject. And he said, there are some certain characteristics and character traits of people who walk in the fear of the Lord. And just ask the Lord to show you where you're getting it right and where you might need to improve a little. Number one, they enjoy intimacy, conversation, and friendship with God. People who walk in the fear of the Lord enjoy intimacy, conversation, and friendship with God. Psalm 25, 14 tells us that friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear them, fear him. You know, when God was sending Moses to go deliver the Israelites, and uh, Moses said, yeah, no, I don't think so. I don't dare to, I can't do this. I don't know that I want to. And God said, you are my friend. And why was he God's friend? Because he walked in the fear of the Lord. And he talked with the Lord. And he had intimacy with the Lord. Number two, people who walk in the fear of the Lord never speak in jest, disrespectfully, or harshly about things of the Lord or spiritual matters. You'll never hear them laughing or joking about holy things. In Malachi 3, again, we hear the Lord's complaint against the people of Israel stating that they have spoken arrogantly against him and mocked him and questioned him. Number three, people who fear the Lord honor and revere the word of God. It's life to them. They know the word. They're in it. They read it. They're familiar with it. They eat the scroll, literally. It is part of their life. In Isaiah 66, 2, we hear the word of the Lord coming through the prophet when he says, but on this one will I look, the one who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. People who fear the Lord do not treat the scriptures lightly. Number four, people who fear the Lord are compelled to live a holy life. In 2 Corinthians 7, the Apostle Paul encourages all believers to cleanse themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting your holiness in the fear of God. People who fear the Lord cannot tolerate ongoing sin in their own lives. It has to be dealt with. And finally, people who fear the Lord do what God says and do what God asks of them, no matter what it is. In Genesis 22, we hear God speaking to Abraham. Again, it's the same verse when he says, don't lay your hand on the lad or do anything to harm him because I know you fear me now. Abraham was ready to do whatever God asked him, even though it would take the, the promise of God. Isaac was the promise. And now God was asking him to sacrifice it. And Abraham didn't understand, but he loved his Lord and the fear of the Lord outweighed everything else. He had trusted God enough to not question what was being asked of him. So do you want to be wise? Then fear the Lord. Do you want to hear God speak to you more clearly and more often? Then fear the Lord. Do you long for spiritual insight and understanding? Then fear the Lord. Do you want to be protected from evil? 
then fear the Lord. Do you want to avoid God's wrath and judgment? Then fear the Lord. Do you want to be healed and delivered from sin and torment? Then learn to fear the Lord because the fear of the Lord brings life. And this is the question. Do you think it's possible to have an, <clears throat> excuse me, an authentic fear of the Lord and still be unsaved? Is it possible to have a real fear of the Lord and still be unsaved? So have you ever thought about that? Whether it's possible to walk in the fear of the Lord and not be saved? The, the demons believe and yeah. tremble. It says yeah. they shudder. Yeah. The hordes of hell. <laughs> They have the fear of the Lord. In Matthew 8, when we see Jesus going about doing miracles and delivering people from demonic possession, it talks about the two demon-possessed men who saw Jesus and they, they acknowledged him as the son of God. And then they said, what do you want with us? And they were fearful of what he was going to do to them. And they asked him to go into those pigs. Uh, but they didn't acknowledge him as their Lord and Savior. They acknowledged him as the son of God. And I'm sure if you think about it, how many people do we meet in our community that aren't churched people, don't profess to be religious people, don't profess to be people of faith, but they know there's a God and they don't want to make him mad. I see that a lot. I hear that a lot with people. They know God exists and they have a fear of him, but they don't call him their Lord or savior. I feel, and it sounds like most of you do, that absolutely you can walk in the fear of the Lord and not be saved. Mm -hmm. I think that's important to acknowledge that fear of the Lord is not a guarantee of salvation. Okay, during our last session, I had explained to you that in 2006, the Holy Spirit downloaded the thing that I call God's fear flow chart, for lack of a better word, that's all that I had in my head. And he gave me that following a conversation with a seasoned ministry leader. She was struggling in her walk with the Lord, and I wanted to know, and she wanted to know if I'd ask the Lord to show me what the problem might be. Um, so while I was sitting with her, I just asked the Lord, and he revealed to me that there was a spirit of fear paralyzing her. And this fear was keeping her from walking in the fullness and the authority of God's call on her life. And then he told me that this applies to the church at large. And it's one of the reasons why the church is so powerless because of fear. The wrong kind of fear, unholy fear. And for more than 15 years, that revelation that he gave to me has been a powerful teaching tool in helping people break free of a spirit of fear. Fast forward from 2006 to 2012, still almost 10 years ago, but in a six year interval, the Lord gave me new revelation and showed me a very different perspective on fear. And this prophetic revelation came to me following another conversation with a dear friend who also happened to be a very successful ministry leader. And when I spoke with my friend this particular day, he was very discouraged. He was a middle-aged man who was feeling weary and battle-worn after more than 20 years in ministry. He just reached a significant milestone in his career and he'd achieved an impressive ministry goal after several years of very hard work. He was well respected by his peers and lauded in his community. But much like Elijah following his great victory on Mount Carmel, my friend was now questioning everything about his purpose his call, his worth, and his future. He was ready to run away. He was considering stepping away from his position in ministry in order to let somebody else take his place. His thought, he thought it might be time for someone younger, someone with more energy. He was questioning everything he thought he'd known. He was burned out and he was tired. Over the years, he and I had had many uh, rich discussions about prophetic dreams that the Lord had given him or I. And one of the common themes between our dreams was that where either he or I were riding horses. And throughout scripture, when we teach on symbolism and dream interpretation, horses often symbolize a move of God 
And the person who's riding the horse is often one of the people that God will use to usher in that move. So I told my friend that day that God wasn't done with him yet and that it was time for him to get back up on his horse and ride. He just laughed and he ended our conversation that day by jokingly responding that he didn't even know where his horse was anymore. He didn't know what his horse was, but when he found it again, he'd let me know. Over the next few days, as I went about my business, I just couldn't shake that conversation and I kept pondering it. And the Lord gave me a prophetic word to share with him. And while it was for him at that time, I also realized that the Lord was giving me insight and understanding regarding the days ahead and that he was giving me a prophetic warning for the church at large. So I wanna to read to you the words that I typed and sent to my friend almost 10 years ago. And as I said at the beginning, there is critical today, perhaps even more so as they were then. And this is what I wrote. My dear friend, the Lord has shown me the name of your horse. It is the fear of the Lord. I believe this is the horse that's been missing in your life for the past several months. You said, when I find it, I'll get back on it. Well, here it is. So jump right up. The Lord has given me a number of scriptures speaking to this issue. And as you review them, you'll find that there's a very clear message commanding believers to steadfastly remain in the fear of the Lord. Without a healthy dose of holy fear and reverence, we tend to end up in the pit of apathy and complacency. Fear of the Lord is a catalyst that will propel you into deeper intimacy with Christ. It will provoke you to seek him, not always out of hunger or because you want to, but out of your love for him, your respect for him and your obedience to him. You know, as a kid, I never wanted to wash the dishes or clean the bathroom, but that was my responsibility within the family. To not fulfill my role meant that I was creating an extra burden and work for someone else in the family. Somebody who may not have the skill and the abilities to do my job. Perhaps they weren't mature enough to carry out that level of responsibility. But sometimes I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. You know, I basically threw a temper tantrum. What if I wanted to dust the living room instead of do the dishes? Hey, I'd still be working, I'd still be busy, but you know what? Nobody asked me to dust the living room. They're waiting for me to do the dishes. I'd be out of position. And when I'm out of position, the whole family is thrown off kilter. To not do what was asked of me demonstrated that my will was not surrendered to the headship of my father. Scripture tells us that this lack of surrender smacks of rebellion, disrespect, and disobedience. And you know what? If I chose to disrespect and disobey or to not fulfill my role and responsibility to my family, then my insolence and laziness often led to discipline and correction from the hand of my father. You might say, oh, but I've been working like a crazy man. I just can't do anymore. The question that needs to be asked first and foremost is what is it that your father longs for from you his, as his son or his daughter? We already know the answer. To use the words of Jesus, there is only one thing that is needful. Scripture also tells us that to him who knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. To not diligently seek out time to spend with our father is to assume a carnal arrogance that says, I will when I'm ready, but I just can't seem to get settled today. The reasons could be varied. I'm so tired. I'm so busy. Uh, too many people need me. There's too much to do. These comments simply reflect an attitude of false humility and martyrdom. It infers that life simply couldn't go on or people won't be able to manage or survive if we're not somehow involved in directing the universe. I'd like you to ponder the following questions. What makes you think that you or I get to determine the trajectory of our spiritual walk? What makes us think that we get to decide where we're gonna end up, who we'll minister to, what fellowship we'll be part of? 
if we're surrendered to Jesus as the Lord of our life, what makes us think that we get to decide the direction of our lives or the trials that we're going to have to endure? What makes us think that we get to decide the pace of our spiritual journey? How long our preparation time will be before we're released into our call or how long we have to endure painful trials and persecution by others? Scripture tells us when Jesus is speaking to the seven churches in Revelation, make up your mind, hot or cold, because I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. In the coming weeks and months, if you find yourself on the outside looking into what God is doing and wondering how you got outside of that, remember this, it won't be because God threw you away. It may simply be the fruit of a disobedient, recalcitrant, or lazy child who has chosen to disrespect the will of his father. The hour is late, the time is critical, and the people of this region are desperate. We are all tired. We all have battle wounds. We all ache in our souls, but we need each other. We need God's warriors on the front lines. And as a fellow warrior, I need you beside me because our kingdom destinies are intertwined. Your role is critical. And you are right. There probably is someone who would be more than ready to step in and take over your role. But that will only happen if you choose to abdicate your position and your call. God will not allow someone to usurp your position and your authority. Only you have the ability to do that. You are the only one who can choose to relinquish your kingdom role. The issue is not whether you fall out of position once in a while or step out of position. The problem starts when we refuse to get back in position within the family. Your father will give you every opportunity to get back in the saddle and reclaim your rightful place so that his purposes can be fulfilled through you. He has anointed, appointed, and called you to be part of his purposes in this place, in this hour. Do not let your emotions, your fears, your intellect, your unbelief, your insecurities, your flesh, or the voices of other people override the things that the Lord has revealed and spoken to your spirit. Please do not make the critical error of stopping in your tracks. Change is difficult for all of us, and God is asking us all to shift in this hour. This shift will require a new measure of surrender to him in our minds and our wills. The church is being called to prepare for the coming harvest. This will require preparation at every level, spiritually, practically, emotionally, financially, and physically. We all will need to prepare, both co corporately and individually. The days ahead will be difficult. You can already see what is coming. But God is seeking a people whom he can trust with his glory and his anointing. God's people will need to be intimately attuned to his voice, his leading, and his spirit in order to stand in the days ahead. So immerse yourself in his presence, saturate yourself in his word. We cannot afford to do anything else. Make intimacy your priority with your father, your spouse, and with select members of a body of believers, truth tellers who are able to encourage, exhort, discern, and correct you as the Lord leads. That was a bold and direct word from the Lord. This is a man who is feeling overwhelmed, burned out, and exhausted. And I had compassion and mercy on him. I wanted to support him. And then the Lord just downloaded this and said, you don't get the right to quit. Well, you can quit, but has God released you from what he called you to? And what makes us think that we get to decide? Is retirement a kingdom principle? At what point do we get to say, okay, I'm done. It's time for the next generation to take over. It was a strong word of rebuke and correction for the church. For me and for my friend at that time. Toughen up, folks. This isn't the time to quit. Um, I've told the story about 
how many times when I'm doing a presentation or teaching in the past, I would work furiously. God showed me what I was supposed to talk about. And I would sit down and do all my research and study and stay up all hours of the night. I still do those things, but not quite as badly. But it'd be like when I get done, then the Holy Spirit would say, okay, you did a lot of good work, but now do you want to know what I want you to say? Um, and I thought I was getting it right, but he'd said, this could have been a lot easier if you would just put the pen and paper and books away and just sit with me and let me tell you exactly what I want to say. Um, it is about refining our hearts. And I did have someone come to me once years ago who said to me, Nancy, this whole concept of taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ is really hard. I said, yeah, it is. It's a discipline and it's obedience because we like to play with things in our minds sometimes. And we figure nobody knows, but that's where the fear of the Lord comes in because the Lord knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're playing with in your mind. And what this individual said to me at the time was, I am acutely aware of how many people will be impacted if I fall and I step away from the Lord. And that's what the Lord does. And that's what I felt when I was talking to my friend uh, that day. I thought, you can't just quit. You're one of the few people here that I link arms with and we need you. I need you in the saddle. You bring a certain set of giftings to the body and to the kingdom purposes across this region. That's not fair. Don't leave us. Don't you think we are all tired and we all want to quit? We're all feeling beat up. It doesn't mean that you're going to be operating at the same level of intensity and passion every step of the way, but it's just saying, don't get out of the saddle. Or if you fall out, let somebody help you get back in. When I sent that word to my friend, I'd done what I felt I was supposed to do. I released the word the Lord gave me. I thanked the Lord for teaching me in the process. But what I wasn't aware of is the Lord wasn't quite done with me yet. Because I, over the next week, I remember driving in my car through town. And it was summer. I remember it being a beautiful sunny day and I'm driving through the downtown with my windows down. And I found myself thinking about my friend and his horse again. And as I did, I kept hearing the slogan from an old TV ad. So I emailed my friend a second time later that day. And I shared with him additional revelation that the Lord had given me. And this is what the second email said. Hello, friend. It's me again. The Lord is continuing to speak to me about your situation. Today, the Lord reminded me of an old TV advertisement that said, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. The Lord reminded me that that was the slogan for the lifeline device. I believe that the Lord is throwing you a lifeline right now through me and other trusted friends. He sees that you've fallen and you're struggling to get up again. He will be faithful to send you a lifeline, but it will be up to you to reach out and grab it. You may think that everything's okay, that you're just in a little slump right now, but it's kind of like the beginning stages of the flu. It starts with a few sniffles and some achy joints, but if we don't take care of the symptoms, get some rest, it can quickly escalate into something more serious and potentially fatal. Grab the lifeline that God is throwing to you. I'm not sure where they are or who they are, but if you look around, I bet you do. As I'm writing these words to you, there, are, there is an old hymn flowing through my mind. And I wrote the words to these lyricals and I, these lyrics. I said, wow, these lyrics are so powerful and timely for right now. I just want to read the words to you. Many of you will be familiar with this. Throw out the lifeline across the dark waves. There is a brother whom someone should save. Somebody's brother. Oh, who then will dare to throw out the lifeline, his peril to share? Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. 
someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. Throw out the lifeline to danger fraught men who are sinking in anguish where you've never been. Winds of temptation and billows of woe will soon hurl them out where the dark waters flow. Soon will the season of rescue be o'er. Soon will they drift to eternity shore. Haste then, my brother, no time for delay, but throw out the lifeline and save them today. This is the lifeline, O tempest-tossed men, battered by waves of temptation and sin. Wild winds of passion, your strength cannot brave, but Jesus is mighty and Jesus can save. Jesus is able to you who are driven farther and farther from God and from heaven, feeling helpless and hopeless, overwhelmed by the waves. We throw out this lifeline. It's Jesus can save. This is the lifeline. Oh, grasp it today. See, you are recklessly drifting away. Voices in warning shout o'er the waves. Oh, grasp the strong lifeline for Jesus can save. Very old hymn, very powerful words. Many of us have fallen and we don't know how to get back up. We're out of the saddle. We don't know how to get back in the saddle. This is why we need the body. And it's why we need to be open and honest and vulnerable with people who love and care about us. If you're struggling, who are you telling? Who are you being honest and authentic with? And people who are discerning can often sense when you're struggling, but if you're not asking for help and you don't desire to get back in the saddle, it kind of leaves us with no way to assist. It's time to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with the Lord and to be honest with select members of the body. I remember a pastor once years ago, he was a pastor I had many, many years ago. And he kind of fell off the radar and nobody heard of him. And one day the Lord brought him to my mind. And he said, I want you to reach out to him. And I want you to tell him that the vision he had all those years ago was correct. And that he's fallen and he needs somebody to help him get back up. And I want you, Nancy, to help him. And so I said, I didn't know how to get this man his email. But I found it somehow and I sent him an email. I said, the Lord wanted me to write to you and he wants me to assure you that the vision you had and the things you saw were accurate and that he's offering you the chance to get back in the saddle and fulfill the call and the vision. Now, keep in mind, I hadn't talked to this man for over 20 years. I didn't know how he was going to respond to it. But when somebody walks in the fear of the Lord, it's not up to me to figure out how it's going to be received. I just have to do what God told me to do. I sent the email and I released it. And it wasn't long and I got an email back. And he said to me, Nancy, I felt God in the words on that email. I would like to meet with you and talk about things. And we met in a local restaurant late one afternoon. And we were about the only ones in the restaurant. And we sat in a private booth. And as I asked, asked him to bring me up to speed on where he was at, there are things that people tell you. And then there are things that the Holy Spirit shows his prophetic people. And I stopped him in the middle of the conversation. And I asked him, I said, do you have a problem with porn? And he just gave me the deer in the headlight look. And he said, yes. I said, do you have a problem with substances? He said, yes. I usually come home from work and my wife sits with her romance novels and I go get a six pack of beer and I sit in front of my computer and watch porn. Okay, well, what do you want to do about that? Is that how you want to spend the rest of your life? Because God has just said he sees you and he's sending you a lifeline. And he said, okay, I want to try to get back in position. And then as he got back in position, he sent me, uh, I said, there's some things I want you to read. I want you to listen to. I want you to feed on the word of God. We need to get the darkness out of your head. And 
things that I sent him or videos he wrote back because he was of a very strong denominational persuasion. And he was so upset with me and wanted to tell me how far I had fallen in my doctrinal beliefs and that this was not of God and how disappointed he was in me. And I proceeded to get lectured and rebuked and corrected by the people I was listening to or the books I was reading. And I met with him for lunch again and the Lord gave me another word for him. But the Lord wouldn't allow me to release it until I had asked him a question and got his answer. But what I said to him was, I listened to him talk and he went into pastor mode and proceeded to teach and preach about why I was outside of sound biblical doctrine. Um, you know, it was basically about the gifts. And I said to him, God's giving me a vision while you're talking. You are a drowning man in an ocean and sharks are circling you. And God has just sent in a great big Coast Guard vessel. And I'm standing on that Coast Guard vessel and I've got the, the life preserver in my hand and want to throw it to you. But you're arguing because you don't like the color of the life preserver. And you don't want that one. So you're going to wait till the next ship. But you don't see from where you are the sharks that are circling you and how much danger you're in. But there are other people that are not in that spot right now that can see and are trying to help and you're fighting against them. And at the end of the day, the Lord had said to me, I set before you this day, life and death, choose life so that you and your descendants might live. And the Lord told me if he does not take the lifeline, it's done. And I'm not responsible. My hands are clean before the Lord. But I had to speak what the Lord said and release it. And I care about people, whether you believe that or not, I deeply care about people. And I've seen what happens. And I knew what this was going to be. My dear friend, the one I'd sent the original emails to, who was burned out. I'd like to tell you there was a happy ending to that story, but there wasn't. I would like to tell you there was a happy ending to this former pastor of mine, but there wasn't. The fear of the Lord is critical for the days ahead. You're going to be scared when you're in the will of the Lord and you're going to be scared when you're outside of it. So you might as well just figure out which fear you're going to walk in. I'm not a big blog reader. I don't follow people. But somehow at the time I sent this pastor, the first friend who was burned out, when I sent him the prophetic word the Lord gave me, I came across a blog written by some, a woman named Star Mead. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was written in the same month in the same year. And she titled it Rekindling the Flame. And I just want to read an excerpt of this. She said, during an extremely painful time in my life, a very simple but very powerful truth hit me. God loves me. It wasn't just people in general whom he loves and me as one person in humanity. No, God loves me. He gave his son to die for me. And if no other person in the universe ever cared about me, I would still have all the love I could ever need in this one person, Jesus Christ. And it was then that I gave myself to the lifelong goal of knowing God. And I wanted to be found a woman after God's own heart. Back then, I felt like I had all the time in the world to pursue that goal. Now, though, I look back over the years that have flown by and I wonder, how can it be that I've lived so many years and yet made so little progress in learning to love and imitate a savior who is worthy of my praise? The one thing I've never had to wonder about is this. What was it that held me back all these years? What was it that so constantly threatened the flame of love for God in me? Why is it that my heart should be on fire, but it's not? It's the sin in me. It's the traitor of my soul. 
So many years have gone by, and despite numerous attempts to get rid of it, the old idol of self just keeps putting itself back on the throne of my life. Why don't I give more glory to God? It's because I'm so hungry for praise for myself. Why don't I seek the face of God with greater zeal? It's because I'm so busy trying to seek comfort and pleasure for me. Why don't I love God as he ought to be loved? Because I'm so busy trying to love myself. Yet there's something that comes time and again to my heart and sparks the love that I have for God. What is it that sparks that flame in my heart? Well, it's usually an ugly encounter, once again, of my sin combined with an awareness of God's infinite grace. It's the ongoing reminder that I can never be as passionate about God or as faithful to him as I really should be. It's the powerful assurance that my salvation rests solely on what Jesus has done for me, and none of my failures will ever undo that. Every time I'm caught in my sin and it's revealed, I'm reminded of God's grace. And my heart catches fire once again with a new blaze of love for him. Time and time again, God has used my failures, my sin, and my unfaithfulness to restore my love for him and his word. How does that happen? It happens when I spend time in God's word and I read the accounts of Israel, his beloved people, rebelling, whining making idols and I see myself right there with them and then I hear God's words of love and promise to them and I realize he feels that way about me as well it happens when I'm hearing the gospel pro proclaimed in such a way then it takes my eyes off my own needs I can focus on the Lord and I hear behold your God it happens when I sit unworthily at the Lord's table and realize that because of his blood, I have been bought. I've been pardoned. And I've been invited to enter into his peace and rest. That is what it means to walk in the fear of the Lord. And when I was writing this email to my friend, I wanted to research the fear of the Lord. What does the Bible have to say about that? And the Lord showed me 19 precepts. Now there was a part of me that wanted to find 20 and make it even, and I'm sure there is 20 in there. I just had to stop because the Bible is replete with scriptures about the fear of the Lord. And I'm just going to tell you the precepts. And in your handout, the reason you have some extra pages is because I wanted you to have the reference scriptures where these precepts came from. And the Lord's still working with me on this, but as a prophetic person, I used to just tell people what the Lord said and what it meant. But people who didn't necessarily enjoy the prophetic did not enjoy truth-telling, um, would often say, uh, support that with scripture, back that up with scripture. And so I spend a lot of my time researching for those people who want to accuse and question, and I just want to say the scripture's right there. Go read it. I'm not going to do all the work for you, but I wanted to give you this because I didn't want to just give you the precepts and say, where did you get that, Nancy? It's right here. So let me, I'm just going to write down through these uh, quickly. We're going to fill in the blanks and you can study it later on your own. So number one, the first precept, the fear of the Lord brings unity to people. These precepts are going to tell you all the benefits, the rewards, the promises, the protection that comes from walking in the fear of the Lord. This is a critical part of any believer's spiritual journey. We need to glean and understand the fear of the Lord for these reasons. First of all, it's going to bring unity. Precept number two, the fear of the Lord brings victory over our enemies. Number three, the fear of the Lord will reveal our iniquities. Number four, the fear of the Lord brings faithfulness. 
and perfects our hearts. Number five, the fear of the Lord brings wisdom. This is a day and age when we need all godly wisdom we can get. Many verses about the fear of the Lord bringing wisdom. Number six, the fear of the Lord endures forever. Number seven, the fear of the Lord must be taught to spiritual children. Our natural children and our spiritual children. I would be doing a disservice if I did not talk to people about the fear of the Lord. Number eight, the fear of the Lord brings knowledge. And as I said earlier, it's the beginning of knowledge. That's when you start to get smart when you walk in the fear of the Lord. Number nine, the fear of the Lord is a choice. It will yield godly counsel and reproof. Number 10. This is a long one with lots of scriptures. The fear of the Lord brings understanding, knowledge of God, sound wisdom for the righteous, strength to the upright, protection for the saints understanding of God's righteousness, judgment and justice, discretion, preservation, deliverance from evil men, and protection from sexual sin. There's nothing more powerful than the fear of the Lord to shove those lustful thoughts out of your head. When you're playing around with impure sexual sin, a good dose of the fear of the Lord will quickly drive that away. Number 11, the fear of the Lord brings hatred of evil, pride, arrogance, and perverted speech. When you walk in the fear of the Lord, the things that God hates, you will hate. You will hate evil. And when you discern for mature believers who have the ability to discern of spirits, have a gift of discerning of spirits. That's different than the gift of discernment. Many of you have the gift of discernment. Only mature believers have a gift of discerning of spirits. And when you are able to discern an evil spirit, boy, does that get you riled up. You should hate it. And it gets really confusing because spirits operate through people often. I can love that person, but hate that spirit that's looking at me out of their eyes. That gets kind of tricky in how to interact. But you will have a very strong repulsion to evil and perversion. Number 12, the fear of the Lord brings long life. Proverbs says the fear of the Lord prolongs your days. But the years of the wicked will be shortened. Number 13, the fear of the Lord brings confidence, not arrogance, brings confidence, refuge, life, riches, honor, contentment, and freedom from evil. How about that word contentment? How many of you can say, I'm really content with my life right now? I'm okay. I'm where I need to be, doing what I need to be. That's a sign of the fear of the Lord. Number 14, the fear of the Lord is better than riches. Again, in Proverbs, it says, better is little with fear of the Lord than great treasure and the trouble that comes with that. Number 15, the fear of the Lord brings deliverance from evil. And the scripture says it delivers us from evil. It doesn't mean we're not going to encounter evil, but it says by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So evil ways that you've been walking in will leave when you choose to walk in the fear of the Lord. But 
again in Proverbs, it says, the fear of the Lord tends to your life, and he that has it shall not be visited with evil. You will be spared a lot of trouble when you walk in the fear of the Lord. Number 16, the fear of the Lord brings freedom from envy and jealousy. How many of you struggle with envy and jealousy? Here's your solution. Learn to walk in the fear of the Lord. Number 17, the fear of the Lord reveals the smallness of man and reflects the glory, the power, and the majesty of the Lord. It's walking into the presence of the Lord and recognizing how small and insignificant you are in his presence. And it's all about him. And it doesn't become about you or me anymore when you walk in the fear of the Lord. Number 18, the fear of the Lord is our treasure. In Isaiah, it says, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of our time. We need that right now, wisdom and knowledge. And it will be the strength of our salvation. For the fear of the Lord is his treasure. And number 19, the fear of the Lord multiplies, edifies, and brings church, uh, peace to the church. We wonder what's happening to the church at large. When we're walking in the fear of the Lord, we'll see multiplication in the church. We'll see this church being strengthened, edified, built up, encouraged, and they will have peace. It brought comfort. The verse in Acts says the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace, being edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Multiplies, edifies, brings peace and comfort. The people of the land can have the fear of the Lord without knowing him. That's what I was talking about. It's like that. But it's a promise that all through scripture, we see people, the other nations that feared the God of the Israelites. And in Isaiah, that says that, you know, in, as the darkness grows, the light in true believers is going to grow as well. And God's glory is going to be expressed. And people will be coming to you if you carry oh. this peace and this comfort and the Holy Spirit. And they're going to say, I want some of that. What is that? What is that? And you want to be careful like Moses that you don't get burned out and get pulled on in too many different directions because um, there needs to be a way to respond to the increasing demands of people. If you're a person, I think most of us, to some extent, like to be liked. Um, I don't want to have to say difficult things. I really don't enjoy it. I don't want to do it. I have told the Lord, like Moses did, yeah, go find somebody else. You always ask me to do this. Find somebody else. But then I do what he asked me to do. And most often, I would say most every time, at least the people knew that I do care for them and I respect them and I'm not trying to be malicious, but I have to be obedient to what the Lord's telling me to do. And that you pay a price because what happens is when you deliver the word of the Lord and I, that brings a fear of the Lord on you because what happens when somebody has to come to you with that kind of word? I am acutely aware that the measure by which I judge or speak is the same way God's going to deal with me. Mm -hmm. But when you deliver that word, it puts somebody right against the wall and God is saying, choose this day whom you will serve. Mm -hmm. And I'm not responsible for their choice, but I am responsible as to whether I'm going to obey or not. And I'm going to be held accountable for that. Yeah. as are all of you when the Lord tells you to do something. You want to make darn sure it's the Lord telling you to speak before you do that. 
And if you're new to this or young in it, you need to run it by spiritual elders who can judge the word before you go off and drop the hammer on somebody. My heart was really broken because every time I know God was doing that and he was putting somebody in a position where they had to choose, uh, I've seen very few people choose God, yeah. God's way. And I think part I, of it is they're never going to be able to stand before God and say, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you send somebody to tell me? Because it will be very clear that he did in his love and his mercy. Look at the ones in these precepts, the things that you desire most or the, where you feel you need some encouragement or strengthening and focus on those scriptures. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted you to have them so that you can, these are working precepts. Now I'd like to talk to you about the need for endurance because we've talked about people who really love the Lord getting weary and burned out and overwhelmed or lots of scars and battle wounds that just take their toll over time. And boy, sometimes it would be easy to just stop. But there is a need for endurance. I'm going to share five scriptures with you. So if you want to write on the back of your paper, one through five. We'll talk about those. The Bible is very clear. There is no room for quitters in God's kingdom. You don't get to quit. We might run the race at our own pace, at different speeds and with different intensities throughout life. But scripture exhorts us to never give up. The only way we can fail is to give up, to stop growing, and stop moving with God. Over the years, I've shared my testimony and the three things that the Lord asked for me, from me. And in a nutshell, it was first, he asked me for my reputation. I thought about that for a while and I said, okay. <laughs> Little did I know how much that was going to sting. <laughs> but he said, you've enjoyed a good reputation in your life. And I'm going to ask you to say and do things that are going to cost you your reputation. I said, okay, you can have my reputation. Then he came back a few days later and asked me for my professional license. And that just confused me because I said, Lord, you the one that told me to go back to school, get this license. You called me to be a counselor. Why would you take my license from me? And he said, I'm going to ask you to say and do things that are going to go beyond the bounds of your professional license. So are you willing to surrender your license if I ask you to? I said, you know, somebody's going to pay for these student loans. <laughs> so I'm not sure what your plan is here, but fine, fine. If you want my license, you can have it. I have followed you long enough to know that you have provided every step of the way I don't need to know the answers, but I'm going to assume that if you require my professional license of me, that you have something else in store and you will find a way to provide. It went a few days, maybe a few weeks, and then the Holy Spirit came back and asked me for a third thing. And he said, I want to know if you're willing to lay down your life for me in this work that I've called you to. And I did not like that question, so I avoided it. And I avoided it for probably a month. And when I share this testimony with people in churches over the years, I've heard, oh, Nancy, that's nothing. He asked that of everybody. I said, no, no, I understand. When they said he asked us to die to ourselves, crucify your flesh. I said, no, I get that. This was something different. I know exactly what he meant. And so I didn't answer him. And every now and then the Holy Spirit would come and tap me on the shoulder and say, do you have an answer for me yet? And I remember the day that I said to the Lord, okay, you win. Yes, if that's what you're going to require of me, you can have it. But you know, I don't like pain. So make it swift 
and painless and be merciful, please. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to know about it. But what struck me in that moment, what I said to the Lord was, if I'm not moving with you, I'm not with you at all. So how do I get to say no? To say no to what the Lord asked of me would be to step, take a step back. And Hebrews 10 warns us about people who take a step back. I don't like the thought that he might require me to give my life. I like life. I'd like to be around for as long as possible. And that night when I went to bed and I told the Lord, yes, you can have my life. I can tell you exactly when it was. It was 2005 because that night when I went to bed, I had a very tormenting demonic dream where Satan appeared to me and said to me, I am going to kill you, you know. And it terrified me. And I remember having this conversation with Satan and then saying, I finally was able to find my words. And I said, you might, but I'm going to fight you till the day I die. And not only can you not have me, I'm going back and get other people. And when I woke up the next day, I had a little heart to heart with the Lord. And I said, this is terrifying. I'm not really sure. I'm not used to having conversations with the Holy Spirit and conversations with Satan. And if I told this to too many people, they might think I was losing my mind. And this is scary stuff. You're asking me to give up my life and Satan says he's going to take it. I'm not really sure what to do with all that. And then he led me to scripture in the book of John where Jesus was in the garden before the crucifixion praying for the disciples. And he said, Father, I pray that you, that you don't take them out of this world, but that you protect them from the evil one and you keep them from the evil one. And then the Holy Spirit said, Nancy, I prayed that for you too. That wasn't just for the 12 apostles. I prayed that for everybody who chooses to follow me. I asked the Father, not take you out of this world, but keep you from evil. And we've already learned that the fear of the Lord brings us life and prolongs our days and delivers us from evil. Why would I not choose to walk in that? When you walk in the fear of the Lord too, you quickly lose the fear of man. It's still there and it can throw me for a loop now and then because if I'm worried about what somebody's thinking or if I've upset somebody or somebody's mad at me, that bothers me. But boys, oh boys, it doesn't bother me anywhere near as much as thinking I've disobeyed the Lord or ticked him off. My fear of the Lord far outweighs my fear of man. And it's what's kept me alive. Thank God. Because he walks with me and he talks with me literally. And he tells me I am his own. There's no room for quitters in the kingdom. We read last time that the first people going to be thrown in the lake of fire and revelation are the cowards. This will be scary, the things that God asks you to do. But it's going to be scary if you're not with him. So what choice do you have, really? Here are a few verses that describe what the Bible has to say about persevering and enduring through difficult times. Number one, in Romans 3, or excuse me, Romans 5, 3 through 5, it tells us that we can rejoice when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop perseverance or endurance. And that perseverance and endurance will then develop our strength of character. And a strong character strengthens the hope of our salvation. And it teaches us that this hope will not lead us to disappointment because we learn to know how dearly God loves us and that he's given us his Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. There's a purpose in difficult times, people. And we are all going to face choices through difficult times. Number two, Galatians 6, 9 tells us that we're not to grow weary in doing good, 
because at the proper time, we will reap a harvest as long as we don't give up. That's the stipulation. You will reap a harvest as long as you don't give up. Number three in Hebrews 12, one, it tells us that since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, the believers who've gone before us, we are to continue to throw off anything that's holding us back from running the spiritual race that's ahead of us. Literally, folks, the baton has been passed to us from future generations. There are people on this call who are carrying mantles and anointings and giftings that have been passed from the generations before you. And there are some in your line and your forefathers where they laid down their mantles and they chose not to walk in the ways of the Lord, but the call on the family line was still there. You can pick that up and keep moving. Because at some point, you're going to be called to pass the baton. And all you can do is sow the seeds, teach and preach the word to spiritual and natural sons and daughters. And then they will decide which one of them are going to pick up the baton and run with it. And not all will. In the parable of the soils, Jesus talked about four soils. Three of them failed. Only one yielded a harvest, but boy, what a harvest that yielded, 30, 60, and 100 fold. We have a responsibility to do our part while we're here. Number four, James 1, 2 through 4, tells us that we should consider it a joy when we encounter trials of many kinds. It's not just one terrible season you go through in your life. You're going to have trials of many kinds. We all do. Because these trials will produce perseverance. And that perseverance will accomplish the goal of growing us up to be spiritually mature and complete, not lacking anything. And finally, in Hebrews 10, 35 to 39. Hebrews 10 is one of the most powerful chapters in scripture for me that the Lord has used to reveal some very profound truths. And in the verses 35 to 39, we read that we're not to throw away our confident trust in the Lord. You don't just give it up, throw it away. We're in need of patient endurance so that we can continue to do God's will. Only then will we receive everything he's promised us. And the verses go on to promise that for in just a little while, the coming one will come and he will not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith, but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls shall be saved. That's an interesting concept. He says he doesn't take pleasure in the ones that turn away and the ones who turn away go to destruction. But the faithful ones are the ones who will be saved. And we will receive all that he's promised. There's a lot at stake, folks. We're all tired. We all feel a little beat up, but there's a lot at stake. We cannot quit at this point in the game. In conclusion, I want to read the words of Matthew 10, 28. And they're the words of Jesus when he commands us to not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather, you should be afraid of the one who can destroy both your soul and your body in hell. If you want to be afraid of something, let it be the Lord. Years ago, I taught a group of pastor's wives. And I would like to say they were there of their own free will, but they weren't. Uh, it had been requested that they attend these trainings. So they weren't really buying into it. And they came to the meetings very in a very cavalier and casual attitude. And it was at a time 
when the Holy Spirit was really strong on me in a way that was kind of scary even to me. And I remember sitting in the back of the room one day during one of these meetings and someone else, uh, my co-presenter was presenting at the front. And as I'm sitting back there and I'm looking around the room, I could feel the mocking. I could feel the disrespect. I could feel the casualness that this group of women were exuding. And we were talking about really holy, heavy things. Like, I, I could feel this righteous anger welling up in me, but it wasn't me. And I remember getting up from the back of the room and walking toward the front and addressing the Lord, er, er, addressing the room in the authority of the Lord. And I said, do you know where you are right now? Do you understand that you're in the presence of the most high God? We're talking about holy things and look at you. Listen to your tone of voice. Look at your face. Look at the way you're sitting. Legs up on a chair with your coffee cup in your hand, uh, laughing at things of the Lord. You need a good dose of the fear of the Lord. If you saw Jesus standing in this room right now, you'd be on your face weeping. Things would stop being funny very quickly. Things would stop being casual very quickly. And I don't know what I said. I wasn't mean. These women knew I liked them. I enjoyed them. We had lots of laughs. We cried together. But boy, that day, the authority of the Lord came through. And to this day, that was 15 to 20 years ago. When I see those women, that's the only meeting they remember. And they'll say, that day that you yelled at us was very scary. I said, I didn't yell at you. I didn't raise my voice but it was the authority of the Lord that he was releasing. And he said, wake up people, don't play with holy things. This is not the time to be playing church. Every one of you is loved, valued and cherished by your heavenly father and by many other people. You need to know this in your heart and your head because the days ahead are gonna to continue to be difficult. Too many believers are not in a healthy place of intimacy with the Lord right now. There is no passion or fire for the Lord in professing believers, the majority. So as we focus our eyes on him and we meditate on his word, hopefully we'll be able to echo the words of David in the days ahead. When he said in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my, the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We can do this, folks. The Lord is calling us to a place of fearing the Lord because the days are about to become fearsome on the earth. So do what you need to do. You've got tools. You've got scriptures. You get a group of believers, do whatever you need to do to come into the presence of a holy, fearsome God and get a kingdom perspective of what's unfolding. So let's pray. And then I will ask you if you have any questions. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the word of the Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you make your word clear from Genesis to Revelation you are consistent and faithful. And you are saying, people, wake up, wake up. Church, regain your fear of the Lord. An awesome respect, reverence, holy reverence, and awareness of who you are. Because you are our hiding place. And in the days ahead, we're going to need to know how to come into your presence and hide under the shelter of your wings and to be protected by the cleft of the rock. That is our only hope and our salvation is the fear of the Lord. So Lord, I ask you to take this word and let the things that are unimportant fall to the wayside. But Lord, I pray that your word would pierce hearts and spirits and minds 
would ignite a fire in the belly and the spirits of men and women on this call. And we just trust you, Lord, for what's ahead. We give you all the praise and the glory. And we know you are at work and you are hovering over the chaos around us. And you are in complete control. We have no reason to fear. And that, Lord, our holy fear is wrapped up in our love for you and an awareness of how much you love us. So we don't, we don't live in torment, a fearful torment but in the assurance that you want our very best and you will protect and care for those who belong to you. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We ask all this, believing it and declaring it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.